everyone and welcome to Rainier View. My name is Michelle. We're so excited you're joining us today as we continue in our series called Simply Christmas, where we'll walk through the opening chapters of Luke for the entire month of December to recapture the simplicity of hope, faith, joy, and peace that are freely offered to any and all who would seek to follow Jesus. Here's Pastor Mike. Well, hey there, I am Mike, and if you know anything about me, you know that I love movies. And at Christmas time, I think everybody knows that there is no shortage of Christmas movies. I, I was online the other day, and I found an article talking about the 100 greatest Christmas movies, which shocked even me, the idea of like, there are 100 Christmas movies that have been made, like that seems excessive. And reading through the list, there's definitely a few movies like, is that really a Christmas movie? But, but I was reading through it, and, uh, and I got to think that in a lot of Christmas movies, there's this common theme of family. Not, not in every Christmas movie, but so many classics have this theme of family that, that is kind of a central theme within the movie. Now, I think about some of my favorites. In the movie Elf, uh, we've got Buddy the Elf, who is a human who is kind of raised uh, up at uh, Santa's workshop in the North Pole, kind of raised with elves, thinking that he's an elf. And eventually, he, he leaves the North Pole, and he travels through the seven levels of the candy cane forest, and he goes past the sea of swirly, twirly gumdrops, and then through the Lincoln Tunnel to get to New York City because he wants to go meet his father, a man that he's never seen before. And then we've got National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, which is about Clark Griswold and his desire to have the perfect Christmas for his family. And if you've seen the movie, you know that everything he tries uh, just goes inconceivably wrong. Like whether it's, you know, the, the, the tree that he brings into his house has a squirrel in it, or the, you know, he puts so many lights on the house that like pretty much shuts down the power grid, like everything goes wrong but he wants to do it because he wants, he wants to have this for his family. And then there's my personal favorite Christmas movie, which is Die Hard. And, and Die Hard is about this New York police officer, John McClane, who flies from New York to Los Angeles on Christmas Eve to be with his estranged wife, Holly, and their kids. And at this Christmas Eve party, things kind of go wrong and he kind of gets caught up with some bad guys and terrorists and whatever at the Nakatomi Plaza and has to blow a few things up, but, like, but it's all about family. Now, parental warning, that one's rated R. I wouldn't recommend watching that on Christmas Eve with the kids. Just my personal opinion. But, but the Christmas season overall, it's, it's a natural time to think about family. You know, in our series, Simply Christmas, today we're talking about how we need to be family. And for some, holiday family gatherings are the highlight of the year. It's an opportunity to gather together, drive to grandma's house, eat great food, exchange presents. You get to see family members that maybe you only see once a year, grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles and cousins and nieces and nephews. You know, maybe this is the only time you get to be with them. But for a lot of people, the holidays are kind of a bummer. And sometimes that's because of family. You know, the, the idea of getting together with family fills you with stress because you think about the inevitable tension at the dinner table or the arguments that are gonna be had when uncle so-and-so brings up this topic or grandpa starts talking about politics or, or whatever it is. And you're like, oh, I don't know if I wanna deal with this again. Maybe it's a difficult season because you start thinking about the family members that, that you've lost who won't be around for Christmas this year, or you think about the family members you won't get to see in 2020 because it's 2020 and, and the season that we're in. But no matter what your experience is like, family will always be tied to Christmas. If you have your Bibles or the Bible app on a device, I'd like you to find your way over to Luke chapter one. Uh, as we look at the original Christmas story, you know, the, the family that we naturally think of is Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, okay? But we're not talking about them today. Don't worry, we'll get to them on Christmas Eve. And we'd love you to join us for our Christmas Eve services. We're gonna have live services at Parkland and Graham, and then we're gonna have our live interactive service online, as well as on demand through our YouTube channel, as well as on our website. But we hope that you join us for our Christmas Eve services. It's gonna be awesome. But, but for today, I wanna to talk about a, a different family element that maybe you haven't considered before. And so we're gonna pick up the account starting in Luke chapter one, verse 26. 
In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So let's quickly cover a few things that you need to know about Mary. And some of these things you probably know, others you may not. The first thing that we, we see in the passage is that she's pledged to be married to this man named Joseph, who, who is a carpenter. Well, what you may not know is that Mary is, is generally believed to be roughly 14 years old. Most scholars kind of believe that was kind of the age range that, that she's in. And so, so by 21st century standards, the idea of a 14-year-old girl getting married um, seems insane or, or, or wrong or you know, inappropriate or whatever. But, but in, first, in the first century, uh, it was totally normal w within the Jewish culture. Um, something else that's different between the first century and the 21st century is this idea that they're pledged to be married. Okay, now, now a pledge is different than, than getting engaged. Okay, like if you wanted to break off an engagement to somebody, like you, you just give back the ring or you ask for back or whatever, and okay, no big deal. But, but in the first century, when you were pledged to be married, that, 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 was, that was considered legally binding. You know, a, 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 the two were considered to be legally married, even though they, they weren't living in the same home yet. And so very different than kind of what it is today. And so one last critical piece of information that you probably picked up as I was reading, uh, but Mary is a virgin, you know, in case you didn't pick that up the first or the second or the third time that Luke writes it in this passage. So she's a virgin. Luke, take it easy. We get it. And we read that Mary is approached by, by Gabriel, who is an angel. Now, not like, oh, he's such a good guy. What an angel. No, an actual angel sent by God. Now, a lot of times w when you read of encounters in the Bible between humans and angels, the vast majority, the, the humans like, are trembling in fear at the sight of an angel. But we don't see that with Mary. And I don't know if it's necessarily because like she's super brave. Like, I don't know. I, I get the feeling that, that maybe... Maybe Gabriel came to her in a way where his appearance uh, wasn't intimidating. He came to her as somebody that would almost put her at ease, like, like somebody, like a good neighbor, maybe. Anyway, while Gabriel's appearance uh, didn't alarm Mary, his words certainly caused her to do a double take. You know, he tells her that she's going to give birth to a child, and this child would be the son of God, and that this child would reign forever. That's a lot of information for a 14-year-old to take in. And there's a lot of ways that Mary could have reacted to this unexpected news. Uh, but Mary doesn't burst into hysterical laughter. She doesn't uh, start screaming and, and crying. She doesn't take a swing at Gabriel or anything like that. She doesn't run away. She accepts the news, which is exceptional. And then she has one question for him. And it's not a doubting question. It's just more out of curiosity, like... So how is this going to work since I'm a virgin? You know, and just in case Mary was thinking like, well, maybe, maybe Gabriel's talking about the baby that Joseph and I are going to have someday. Maybe, maybe he's referring to that in the future. Well, Gabriel tells her again in, in verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. I, I don't know what you say to that. I, I don't know how Mary could have responded to that. But, but beyond what she says here, I, wanna, I want us to think about a, a different question that Mary might have been asking herself in this moment after she's gotten this simply unbelievable news. And that's the question, who do I turn to now? Who can I turn to? I mean, now clearly Mary knew that, that God was there for her. I mean, in Gabriel's welcome, he says, you know, greetings, the Lord is, is with you. But what people could she turn to in life? 
I mean, she was in a very unique situation. Like, was she going to turn to her parents? Maybe she's thinking, like, what are my parents going to say when they find out that, that I'm pregnant? Dad's going to kill Joseph. Like, this is terrible. I, 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 maybe she felt like she couldn't talk to them. I, I don't know. Maybe she's thinking, like, maybe I could tell my friends. How are my friends going to respond? Like, her friends are all probably teenage girls as well. How are they going to respond to the news when she says, oh, by the way, I'm pregnant with God's child. Like, yeah, like other teenagers are going to be able to manage that really well. How is she going to tell Joseph? You know, we actually see in Matthew's gospel account, when Joseph learns about this news, his plan is to go ahead and get a divorce. Because why would he believe that, that she's pregnant, you know, with, with God's child? He, he's going to automatically assume it's another guy. And so he wants to divorce her until another angel comes to him and says, no, this is God's child. You're going to marry him. And so due to the nature of Gabriel's message and, and this feeling of like, who do I turn to? I have a feeling that the, in the moment, Mary might have felt like the loneliest person on the face of the earth. I mean, who could possibly understand what she was going through? How could anybody help her with such overwhelming news? Have you ever been in a place in life like that where whatever you were going through was just too much and it didn't feel like, it didn't matter who you went to, like there, there's no way that they're going to be able to, to help. There, there's no way that they're going to know what to say and, and, and a time when you were left feeling just so completely alone because nobody's going to understand, nobody can help. If you've ever been in that place, I think you might be encouraged in what happens next in this passage. So we're going to pick it up in verse 36. And this is Gabriel still talking to, to Mary. And he says, Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. So at the very moment when Mary might have felt completely alone in the world, she gets the news that she has a family member who can kind of relate to what she's going through. I mean, not exactly what she's going through, but, but still, still, that is, that is big news. You know, in the passage that I read, it says that, that Elizabeth is, is Mary's relative. And in another version in the New King James translation, um, she's described as, as, as a cousin, but, but more than likely they're, they're probably more like fourth cousins uh, because of the, the, there's a pretty big age difference. In, in Luke chapter 1 verse 7, we read the following, but they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. So Elizabeth was never able to have children and, and now she was at an age where it was considered practically impossible to conceive but Elizabeth's pregnancy was also foretold by this same angel, Gabriel, who is now telling Mary, Elizabeth's out there. She's six months pregnant. Yeah, it seems impossible, but it's true because God's promises never fail. And so I think Mary's confusion kind of morphs into confidence. And, and, and she says this, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And I think possibly her faith-filled response is, is partially fueled by the fact that she knows she's going to have family support. She's going to have somebody that can help her through this. And support is definitely what she receives. We need to keep reading here, picking it up in verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered a Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Now, we don't know the exact time frame when Mary goes to Elizabeth, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if it was like the day after, like, you know, right, she gets the news from Gabriel, packs up a bag and heads right to Elizabeth's house. And when she arrives, maybe she's a little worried of like, what's she going to say? What's she going to do when I tell her the news? But the welcome she gets is the best thing that she could have ever hoped for, um, you know. Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit and, and this knowledge of who this child is and speaks this incredible blessing 
over her relative. And that's exactly what Mary needed at that very moment. She needed family who wasn't just going to believe what she was going to go through, but was going to be there to support her with what she was going to be going through in this crazy time. And Mary just didn't stay for an afternoon visit. Okay? It wasn't like, oh, you know, I'll go over, we'll have tea, and then I'll head back. We read this later on in verse 56. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. So Elizabeth, whom we read back in verse 26, she's, she's six months pregnant. And even though she's never been pregnant before, she's six months in, she's going to support Mary through her first trimester. It's awesome. I, I love the relationship of these two. And what, what we see in this passage is what it means to be family to one another. This relationship between Mary and Elizabeth, it's what it means to be family. And I think, I think there's some really important takeaways for us as we, as we look at these two faithful, godly women. And the first takeaway is this idea that we have to be willing to turn to family for support. And that doesn't always come naturally for us. Sometimes family are the last people that we want to turn to because we may have these, these uh, thoughts in our minds and we may be tempted to think, you know what, I, I can't. I can't burden them with this issue. You know, they've already dealt with so much with me, like to just bring one more thing to my family, like I can't do that to them. Or even worse, we might think, they don't want to hear this. They, they, they don't want to deal with more of my issues. They, 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 they're done with me. But we have to be willing to give family a chance to be supportive. You may be surprised at how they respond. Mary had a very unique situation. I mean, literally. She's the only person carrying the child of God, the future savior of the world. Nobody else is going to be able to relate to that. But she was still willing to go and see Elizabeth because she needed family. Maybe you're like Mary, not exactly, but maybe you're like Mary and you need support during a challenging season of life. And I want to encourage you to turn to family, turn to somebody in your family for support, and whether it's a parent a sibling, could be a child, a more distant relative, it could be a fourth cousin, but consider somebody in your family to be able to turn to them. The other takeaway is, as we look more at Elizabeth is that we have to be available as family to support each other. We have to be available to family as a support. Now, the temptations in our thought life are going to be different in this area. Okay, I, I, need, to, I need to be family to others, but what if they come with, with something that I don't know how to handle? What, what if the situation is so out of control and, and I don't know what to do? I, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to fix it. I'm not a, I'm not a professional counselor. I'm not a pastor. I, 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 I don't know what to do in this situation. You, you don't have to be a professional. You just have to be family. You just have to be there for the person. I mean, con consider Elizabeth. She is really old. She's never been pregnant before and she's pregnant six months in. Do you think she had the answers for Mary in that moment? There's no way. But she was there for Mary. And, and not just, hey, hey, so call me whenever you need me. It was, no, come into my home, live with me. And Mary stayed with Elizabeth pretty much right up until the moment when Elizabeth was about to give birth to her son, John. You know, Elizabeth takes her in because she wants to be family to Mary. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, we probably need to listen to both of those takeaways. There are probably some ways where we need to be supported by family, and there's probably some situations where we need to support our family. Because again, that's what it means to be family for one another. But this is a concept that I would say goes beyond our biological families. And I, I think for some of us, what I'm talking about may feel absolutely impossible. Um, but again, the concepts go beyond biological family. It extends to God's family, okay? And God's family is, is the church. And if you need support from your church family, I encourage you to, to reach out. And if you know somebody in your church family that needs to be supported right now, the same advice, reach out. But how? That, that's kind of the hard part, right? Like, well, what do I do? And how do I start that? And, and I, I don't know how to begin. And, and it's harder now, right? Because of COVID-19 and, and life in general, like it's, it's harder to go out and get a coffee with somebody. It's harder to go and grab lunch with somebody. Like it's just more difficult. And the good news is that we live in a time and an age where 
technology allows us to be able to reach out in ways that, that we wouldn't be able to do before. And so if you have a Facebook or an Instagram account, uh, the church wants to help you kind of take this next step. Um, we want to give you a really simple, non-threatening way to be able to reach out to somebody. Okay. So if you don't follow us on Facebook or Instagram yet, uh, now's the time to do that. We would love to have you as a follower. And, and when you get to our feed, you're going to find the following picture here. Okay. So, so on that picture, you see the caption, tag someone you want to catch up with. Okay. And so you may be asking, well, what does it mean to tag somebody? And I'm really old. I don't know if I'm the best person to describe that, but, but, but essentially, you know, tagging somebody, you're going to put their name in the comments to let them know that you're thinking about them. You know, on, on Facebook, you know, in the comment section, just start typing out that person's name. There'll be like, you know, a little pop-up window. And as you type their name in, you'll see different names pop up. And so when you see that person, just click on it. Their name will be in blue, I think. So you can just do that and they're tagged. On Instagram, you put the little at sign and then you start, you know, again, type the name in, you'll see their name pop up and just click on it. Well, what does tagging actually do? It's, it's nothing magical, but, but what it does is it alerts the other person that you're thinking about them, that they are on your mind. And that's huge. And, and, and maybe they'll respond, maybe they'll comment back, or maybe they'll click the like button. But even if they don't, you have now started to open that door for a connection. You know, and then it gives you an opportunity then to, to send a text or an email or, or, or to call and just say like, hey, I would love I'd love to talk. I'd love to connect. I, I, I want to hear how you're doing, or I need to talk to you about this. You know? and, and if you don't have social media, or if the person you want to connect with doesn't have social media, that, that, that's okay. You can kind of skip the social media step. And, and you know, maybe it's just a matter of sending a text or giving them a call and saying like, hey, when can we catch up? There's some things that I would love to talk to you about. And so I want you right now to determine who that person is. Who is it that you need to reach out to either because you would really like their support or you'd really like to give them some support in where they're at in life? So determine who that is and then set aside a time today to go ahead and tag them or, or to reach out. Because again, family is a huge part of the Christmas season originating over 2,000 years ago. God enables Mary to give birth to Jesus because God wants you to be part of his family, the church. But God also wants you to know that you can turn to him. You know, maybe Mary was asking that question, who do I turn to? And, and she knew God was there. I want you to understand that God wants you to be able to turn to him when you're going through something hard. In fact, God wants to be the first one that you turn to. God is, is, is our loving Heavenly Father, and He wants to embrace us no matter where we're at in life, no matter what we've done. He wants us to know that He loves us. And He wants to be there for you during life's challenges and, and these really hard times of life. We need to be able to turn to family, but He wants us to turn to Him as well. And to be part of God's family, we need to put our faith in His Son, Jesus. And if you've never placed your faith in Jesus, or if you'd like to learn more about what does it mean to be part of God's family, we would love to talk more with you. And so I'd encourage you to, to fill out the connection card, maybe put a prayer request in there, and we would love to reach out. You can fill that out and, and, and click send, and a member of our church family will contact you this week. Church, thanks for being here this morning. We love you. Let me close our time in prayer. Father God, we thank you for family. And family can be a really mixed bag, and we can love our families or really struggle with our families, God, but you have placed us in our families for a reason. And part of that reason is to be able to support one another. And so God, I pray that you would help each one of us to be able to identify that person that we want to reconnect with, that person that we want to reach out to either because we'd really like their support in what we're going through, or we want to support that person in what they're dealing with right now. God, help us to take that step, to reach out, to tag that person, to text that person, to email them, whatever it is, God, to open up that door of communication so that we can be family to one another. God, thank you that we get to be part of your family because of what your son Jesus did for us on the cross. We love you so much and we're thankful. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 
Thank you so much for sharing with us today, Mike. We have so many opportunities this season for people of all ages, and we wanna make sure that you are staying in the loop about it all. The best ways to do that is through our all church emails, by following us on Instagram and Facebook, or check in anytime at rainierview.org. We're so excited to be hosting our annual Christmas at RVCC services this year on Christmas Eve. They'll be taking place at 3 and 4.30 p.m. at our Graham and Parkland campuses and anytime at rainierview.org. Also, for our families with children, check out the Virtual Christmas Family Experience, or FX Night, that happens on Friday, December 18th. This will be a great time for the whole family. Interactive kits will be provided. Please sign up at rainierview.org events. We're a church that loves to be generous. If you call Rainier View your church home, you can give by simply texting RVCC to 77977 to use our safe and secure online system. You can also give on our website or send in a check. If you're joining us for the first time today, please don't feel any obligation to give. We're just so glad that you're here. As we close today's service, we'll continue celebrating the season of Advent. Here's Jessica to lead us in that time. We are in the middle of the season of Advent. The last two weeks, we've spent time recognizing that the season is centered around this idea of waiting. We wait for the return of Jesus, just as the Israelites in the Old Testament waited for the Messiah. As the weeks of Advent continue, you'll notice that the candles on the wreath get smaller and smaller as a way of showing that the return of Christ is drawing nearer. The first week we lit the hope candle, which represented the hope that we have in waiting for Christ's return. Last week we lit the Bethlehem candle, and that represents not only the humble beginnings of our Savior, but also the peace that he brings. This week we will light the third candle of Advent, which represents joy. As followers of Jesus Christ, we have great joy because we have a God who stepped into our world to save us. In the Old Testament, the word joy is nearly always associated with an act of God, and even more specifically, with an act of God delivering his people. The people of Israel found themselves in need of God's deliverance on more than one occasion. <laughs> when they were enslaved in Egypt, God set them free. As they traveled to the Promised Land, God proved to the Israelites over and over again that he was far stronger and more powerful than the enemy nations who opposed them. When the nation of Israel was carried off into captivity by the Babylonians, again, they cried out to God to rescue them, and God delivered them and brought them back to Jerusalem. Each time they were rescued, the Israelites were joyful and rejoiced in God's love for them. But each time they soon forgot about God's deliverance and turned away from God. In a cold and dirty stable in a small, unimportant town of Bethlehem, God again delivered his people. But this time, it was not just for a time, but it was until, the, or not just until that next warring nation came over the river. This time, it was forever and for all of eternity. God sent his son to deliver his people, not just from their enemies who threatened them, but from their sin that separated them from himself. Luke 2 says, and there were shepherds living in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will, be, that will cause great joy for all of the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. As the angels brought good tidings of great joy that Jesus Christ, the Savior and the Messiah, was born, they joyfully responded. We can almost imagine the joy on the faces of the shepherds as they made their way to the stable. The next verse in Luke says that they hurried off to go and see for themselves. Joy caused the shepherds to act, and the joy of Christ should cause us to do the same. So today, as we celebrate Advent and think of joy, let's remember and live each day in the knowledge and understanding of what God has done for us. Let's pray. God, we are filled with joy at the thought of your compassion for us. Thank you for being Emmanuel, God with us. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We're now gonna go into a time of communion. As we've said before, communion is a chance for us to just stop, quiet ourselves, and reflect on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Today, I hope that you'll take a moment in your reflections to think about the joy that we have and the fact that Jesus came and he died for us, for our sins, so that we can have newness of life and we get the opportunity to wait for him, to wait for his return. And so may joy fill your hearts as you reflect on the sacrifice of Jesus. 
Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy my own God and sinners reconciled Joyful all ye nations rise Join the triumph of the skies With angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Christ by high is heaven adored Christ the everlasting Lord Late in time behold him come Offspring of the virgin's womb Veiled in flesh the God at sea Hail the incarnate deity Pleased as man with man to dwell Jesus our Emmanuel Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King. Newborn King. Hail the heaven born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings Risen with healing in his wings Mild he lays his glory by Born that man no more may die Born to raise the sons of birth Born to give them second birth Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Glory to the newborn King Glory to the newborn King. Oh, glory to the newborn King. Glory to the newborn King.